morning. I'm Frank Stroud. I'm the Deputy Director for the Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation, and Reentry. Today, by the order of the Arizona Supreme Court, the state of Arizona carried out the death sentence of Frank J. Atwood by means of lethal injection at the Arizona Prison Complex here in Florence. Pre-execution preparations began at 9.37 a.m. and concluded at 10.04 a.m. The execution commenced at 10.04. Inmate Atwood was pronounced dead at 10.16 a.m. His last words were, and I quote, Thank you, precious Father, for coming today and shepherding me into the faith. I want to thank my beautiful wife who has loved me with everything she has. I want to thank my friends and legal team and most of all Jesus Christ through this unfair judicial process that led to my salvation. I pray the Lord will have all of us, have mercy on all of us and that the Lord will have mercy on me." End of quote. At this time, I'd like to introduce Judy Keene, our Director of Communications for Arizona Department of Corrections and Reentry. Good morning. Uh, we will begin now hearing from our media witnesses. They will share their observations with you. Following our media witnesses will be Ms. Colleen Clace, who is Chief Counsel for the Arizona Voice for Crime Victims. Uh, she will be reading a statement. She is also the attorney for Debbie Carlson. Uh, she will not be taking media questions after she reads her media statement. Ms. Clace will be followed by Debbie Carlson, who is the mother of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. Uh, Ms. Carlson will also be reading a statement, and she has asked uh, that she not be asked any questions from the members of the press after as well, too. Um, so at this time, I would like to introduce our first media witness, Bud Foster from KOLD uh, TV Tucson. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the precious father that he was talking about was the priest. He was able to have the priest inside the execution room with him. Uh, that is a first for the uh, for the state. Uh, the priest stayed with him uh, through the entire process. Uh, he held a cloth and a medallion on his head. Uh, they conversed on occasion. But the precious father was the priest that they allowed to come into the to the death chamber. And again, that's the first time that that's happened. Um, also, for the very first time, um, we saw. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, Frank, Frank Atwood being brought into the chamber uh, rather than opening the curtain uh, and having him already on the table. Uh, they brought him in and we were able to watch the entire process the, of, of uh, putting the IVs in both of his arms. Um, I've witnessed executions in the past um, and they usually use one arm. In this case, they use both arms. Uh, we still don't know why that might be the case, um, but we can certainly we can certainly find out. And I'll give you a little bit about the process. There were uh, approximately 40 people in the room, um, and Debbie Carlson was to my left. Uh, Atwood's wife, Rachel, was to my right. Uh, several times during the process, he looked over at his wife and smiled, um, but he was very calm through the entire thing. Um, he never. Uh, tried to um, pull on any of the restraints that were on him. Uh, the restraints, he had restraints on the ankles. They had um, restraints uh, near the knees, uh, again, during the waist and at the chest. So he was restrained in several different places, uh, in several different ways. Um, but never once did he uh, attempt to pull on any of the restraints. Uh, he was very calm, very relaxed through the entire process. Um, he chatted occasionally with the, uh, uh, the doctors who were putting in the IVs and doing the other pre-work that they were doing, so he would chat with them on occasion. Um, not exactly sure what he was talking about, but uh, whenever they were putting in the IVs and they were searching for veins, uh, he would say uh, something to the doctors uh, as they were um, getting him prepped for, for the execution. Uh, you heard uh, the last words. Um, you've heard the time, um, so I'm not going to get into that at all. Uh, but it took about 20 minutes uh, in prep work. Uh, there didn't seem to be any issues, didn't seem to be any problems. Uh, they were able to find the veins uh, that they needed to find and found them very quickly. Um, so that was not a problem. Uh, again, like I say, I've witnessed other executions which were uh, 
somewhat hard to watch, uh, John Brewer in 1993, who fought very hard um, before uh, his execution. Uh, and this one, I would have to say, it was probably the most peaceful of any of the executions that I have witnessed in the past. I think Lupita might say the same thing. Um, there was nothing that would lead you to believe that he was being prepped for anything other than uh, maybe surgery or an operation or something to that effect. Uh, it was not, it was very clinical. Um, I would have to say very, very clinical. Um, and uh, there was nothing uh, about it that was difficult. Now, um, this was the first time we were able to see the entire process. Um, so um, I can't tell you what happened afterwards. I can't tell you what happened before. All I can tell you is that we were able to watch him being brought in, laid on the table, restrained. Um, during the time, he would close his eyes, uh, close his eyes frequently, uh, or he might just stare at the ceiling. And as I said, he acknowledged his wife on uh, several occasions. He would look over at her. She was on my right. Um, he would look over at her and smile. Uh, but as far as any kind of uh, fighting or um, he seemed to accept his fate, um, he did not apologize uh, in his last words. Um, he did um, talk about the judicial process or the legal process, uh, and he said it was unfair, uh, but uh, he did not apologize to anyone, um, and uh, I was sort of surprised by that. I think a number of people had thought that he might do that because he had said earlier um, that um, he hoped that this brings peace to the family, but he did not reiterate that uh, during um, the execution uh, this afternoon. Uh, they sedated him. It took about seven minutes uh, to be sedated. They announced after they read the death warrant, they sedated him. It took about seven minutes for him to, uh, to be sedated. The doctor came in and said um, he's sedated. They announced that. Uh, and then the execution began. Um, and it was, what, maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, eight to 10 minutes, 12 minutes before uh, he was pronounced dead. That's what I have. Uh, I'll introduce Lupita from KVOA, um, and she'll give you her observations. I'm Lupita Murillo, News 4 Tucson, and Bud, this takes us back uh, to 1984 when you were the anchor at Channel 4, and uh, you would introduce me to some of the stories, especially this one. Remember that? Bud has pretty much done a, a very good job of going through everything that we witnessed inside the death chamber. I want to um, address the family here. The family for nearly 40 years has waited for this day. And what the family has gone through is unimaginable. I think we need to focus on that. At least that's what I'm going to do. I have known the family since 1984. And like many of the deputies that worked to, to find Vicki, I have remained friends with them. And it was, um, it's come full circle. I was there the night that this happened, and I was there this morning when uh, he took his last breath, and that was it. Um, I kept thinking myself of what little Vicki Lynn was going through when he was convicted of murdering her and kidnapping her. I kept thinking of that as he lay on the gurney and he just took a couple of breaths. And at one point, it was like he was snoring and then he closed his eyes and then that was it. It was very peaceful. And I, like Bud, have witnessed several executions. This has been by far the most calm. There wasn't any jerking movements on his part like I've seen in the past. And um, he, um, Let's just say that the state carried out the law. He is dead. Uh, hi, my name is Henry Breen. I'm a reporter with the Arizona Daily Star in Tucson. Um, this was my first uh, execution I've witnessed. Uh, don't have a lot to add to what these folks have said, other than um, he uh, uh, he was almost helpful to the to the physicians or the or the medical personnel as they were uh, putting IVs in his arm they they uh, put IVs in both arms um, left arm first uh, they had a little bit of trouble um, finding a vein they used an ultrasound uh, wand to try and find the vein on his right arm 
Uh, they eventually did. They put a needle in, but apparently it didn't work. So they, um, at his suggestion, uh, inserted the needle into his uh, right uh, hand for, for that side. Um, unclear um, why they did IVs on both sides, but it appeared that they only uh, injected on one side uh, of the uh, uh, of the IVs, they only actually used one uh, set of IVs that I could tell. Um, and like uh, these folks reported, um, he uh, was there with a the, with the priest. He spoke a little bit to him, but mostly he was quiet. Um, he thanked the uh, medical personnel as they worked on him. Um, and then uh, he went to sleep. He snored a little bit um, and stopped breathing, and, and that was it. Any questions? Yeah, it, it did appear he had a wedge-shaped pillow that, that they placed behind his head. He didn't complain about his back uh, that we saw during the process. The only complaint he made was at one point he complained that his left hand restraint was digging into his arm, and they adjusted it for him, and he thanked them, and that was it. Uh, she was crying throughout most of it, sniffing. She, that was pretty much the only sound in the witness room was, was her crying. Um, there, there was an attorney there that was holding her hand. There was someone from the church with their hand on her back behind her. Uh, but that was pretty much the only sound in the witness room was, was uh, her crying. And he also had, remember that religious hat with the cross? And yeah. He wore that. Yeah, he was wearing a, a hat with a red cross on a black hat with a red cross, same hat that the priest was wearing. Um, any other questions? Do you know, do you know if the priest was on him when he came? The priest had his hands on him for the entire process. Um, he was holding a, a red vestment uh, on top of his head, and then he had a medallion that he placed on top of uh, Mr. Atwood's head and held it there throughout the entire process. Do you know if that was the one that came in out of the hospital and started? Uh, not that I could tell. I, I believe it was from 10.04 to 10.16. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, from, they, from start to finish, they did not. Oh, I, I believe that. I think they said that started at 9.37, um, and then they were ready to go at, at, and started administering the drugs at 10.04, from my understanding. Um, that's when they started the process of, of prepping him. When, when they actually inserted the needles, I would have to, to check, but it was all within that window. and then they announced the warrant at um, right at 10 o'clock. So the, the whole prep process took about 30 minutes. Yeah, that's There's about, about 40 people there at Bud Nathan, but also the Attorney General is also there. It's not kind of a option to have to go down there in the jail. Any other questions? When he was declared unconscious, what did he do in the form of sex that he took sleep? Uh, they, before they announced that he was sedated, they did come in and check his his pupils and, and uh, reactions, I, I believe, is what they were doing. Um, and then... Yeah, they were lifting his finger with the yeah. hand. Then the next thing they did was came in and pronounced him dead. There was a clear demarcation from the uh, administration of the sedative to the, the lethal. Um, he went to sleep and really didn't stir after that. Um, uh, it was difficult to tell. Um, I believe they were on the third syringe when he, when he became unconscious, um, but I'm, I'm not for sure on that. He, he, was, he was sedated at 10.10, and the execution was completed at 10.16. You could see the color in his face, bleeding uh, at the very end. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I could tell. But, I mean, just from the observation, since I'd seen this happen before, I saw the color in his face leave. head slightly to the right uh, and remained in that position uh, throughout uh, and then 
uh, after they announced that he was sedated and came back uh, a few moments later. You could see the color leaving his face. Uh, so you knew that it was, he was, e he was either deceased at that point or very close. Did he look towards the result as he was standing? No, no, he did not. At no point. Any other questions? Okay, as noted, we will now hear from Colleen Clays, and then she will be followed by Vicki Lynn's mother. Thank you. Good morning. Today marks the, a close to an almost 38-year criminal justice process. It comes more than 35 years after death, the death sentence was pronounced on May 8th. 1987. The direct appeal took approximately five years. The first post-conviction relief proceeding took over four years. And shockingly, the federal habeas process exceeded 20 years. Throughout this process, there were at least 90 events that triggered delay. These events included motions to extend filing deadlines, motions to reconsider rulings, motions to, con to continue proceedings, and stays of proceedings. While capital defendants have a right to fully exhaust their appellate remedies, the process should not be permitted to be used as a tool to ultimately avoid the imposition of punishment long after legal, excuse me, long after legal issues have been relitigated. There have been repeated claims of innocence despite overwhelming evidence of guilt. The procedural history in this case has been described by one court as regrettably long. Delays of this magnitude violate victims' constitutional, excuse me, constitutional and statutory rights to a prompt and final conclusion of the case after the conviction and sentence, and to be free from unreasonable delay. They should never be permitted to happen. Attorneys should be accountable for filing timely petitions, and courts should ensure that victims' rights are considered and upheld. For decades, it would be fair to say that the criminal justice system failed Vicki's family. That changed today. This process is finally over, but it's over without an apology, without any semblance of remorse, and without accepting responsibility. The scales of justice are now in balance, and the Carlson family can now move forward. But we acknowledge that today would not have been possible without Attorney General Mark Brnovich and his dedicated staff who have upheld victims' rights. They have worked tirelessly over the last few weeks, days, and even hours through the night responding to legal challenges. Additionally, the thanks is owed to the Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry, especially the Victim Services Unit for the support that they have provided to the family. Vicki's mom, Debbie, will now speak with you. I ask that you respect her boundaries and allow her to tell you about Vicki. But I ask further that your reporting will be done in a way that honors Vicki's memory. Thank you. Please bear with me. Today marks final justice for our daughter, Vicki Lynn. Our family has waited for 37 years, eight months, and 22 days for this day to come. Vicki Lynn was born on February 2nd, 1976, a bicentennial baby, blessing this earth on Groundhog Day. When Vicki was little, she had a hard time pronouncing her G's, and she called it Hound Dog Day. This stuck, and is how our family to this day refers to it. 
she took pride to be born on this very special day. Vicki was a vibrant little girl with an infectious laugh and a smile that would melt your heart. Her royal blue eyes reflected an old soul of wisdom and her freckled nose was unique and we are blessed to see it in our grandchildren today. Vicki was a feisty little one that always kept you on your toes and will forever be known as Dennis the Menace. Giggling all the way, she wouldn't let you get away with turning your head for a kiss goodbye, especially from her papas, my dad. Vicki loved spending time with her nanas and her papas and was so proud that he was a champion and never missed cheering him on at the racetrack on a Saturday night. Vicki loved being at their house on holidays and hanging out on Sundays for barbecues. She loved her Nana's tacos the most. She could put away five tacos without batting an eye, and she was only eight. <laughs> She loved it when her Aunt Kimmy would come and babysit and feed her SpaghettiOs and French fries, her other favorite. Vicki loved going swimming at Grandma and Grandpa Carlson's house. Her Grandpa Carlson had a soft spot for her, calling her Oogle Boogle. Actually, he's the one who nicknamed her Dennis. <laughs> and she especially loved the homemade raviolis they made for the holidays. Vicki loved the homemade sweet pickles <clears throat> her grandma Hoskinson always had in the fridge. The pallet bed she slept on with her cousins and going to church with her on Sundays. I always had to dress Vicki last whenever we were ready to go somewhere because she would always manage to find a mud paddle, a dirt pile of dirt, or the water fountain, or a chocolate bar. She'd find something to get herself dirty. Vicki was smart. She was witty, kind, and loving. She had a temper. People say she was a mini me. I'm really proud of that. She loved playing Barbies with her sisters and playing dress up in their playhouse and in the, back, in the backyard and dressing up her little brother, sorry, Brian, in girl clothes <laughs> and pushing him around the neighborhood in the stroller with his sisters, Carrie and Stephanie. She was proud to be a big sister and thought it was fun to put Brian in the laundry basket and drag him around the house. Vicki loved her trips to the lake and boat rides and night lights under the and nights under the starry sky and loved and her love for her sisters and brothers were immeasurable. Vicki was a fierce competitor and was good at anything she tried. Tetherball, racing across the monkey bars, and her love of softball was evident. I can't help but think that she would have been a wildcat softball player, just like her cousin Allie. Every opportunity she had to spend with her aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends were special times she loved and cherished. She was blessed with family and friends in her life. In her death, she did the same. You didn't have to personally know her to know Vicki, to love her. It is Vicki's gift to us that we get to see her and our grandchildren, each having a different part of her vivacious personality, her competitiveness, her compassion, and her love for others. As her parents, we could not be prouder of her and her accomplishments in her eight short years of life. Vicki, you made a difference. The lives you saved, the hearts you touched, will never know. I hope you're proud of us and how we've carried on your legacy. 
to my sister Lori. I know you have carried a burden all these years since Vicki was taken on your birthday. Please know, Vicki would want you to fully celebrate your birthday and not look back. I hope you can finally fully feel the joy of that day now as it's set free. We can never thank every single person who have been a part of this journey with us. There are far too many individuals to individually name, but you all know who you are. From every law enforcement agency, victim services advocate, attorneys, prosecutors, H.T. Mark Bronowicz, Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry, we thank you, and the media. We thank you for all your hard work, dedication, your support that you've given our family over all these years. So many of you have become personal friends today. Another precious gift from Vicki. To all our friends, our neighbors, our community, those across the world, that have been in touch with us over the years, we can never express our love and thanks for your undying support to our family. To Vicki's childhood friends and classmates, we want you to know that Vicki was blessed to have you in, their life, in her life. We know in our hearts how much you loved her and she is with you every day. Cherish your memories and experience the joy she's brought you. To our church family, we would not have survived without our faith. Your constant prayers over the years and today are felt every moment. If only, it is only because of God's grace and truth that we have endured these times of trial. May God have all the glory. Vicki, I want you to be free, little one. Rest easy, our precious little girl. May your spirit soar as it continues to live with us, in us, and through us forever. Till we meet again, we will miss you, and we will always love you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carlson. Thank you. This concludes our press conference. Um, I would ask that you uh, allow the Carlson family to leave, please, first. Um, we will have vans waiting for you to take you back to the media staging area where you are welcome to continue to do your reporting, live shots, uh, stand-ups, report filing. Um, and we thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.